we've been covering all the scriptures in the Old Testament that speak about them, almost all, but we've gone into it intensely. Tonight I'm going to cover what we covered last week, and I urge you guys to watch for the past five weeks to get all of this. You get it? And this is very, very important because we should be so excited. So excited. Because we're going to face the end times with two prophets representing the fullness of God. Moses, the law, and the bringer out of his people. And the prophet Elijah and Elijah, they have the same mantle, which represents the prophets and the law of the prophets. So we'll cover some little, a little bit of ground from last week. Remember, this is in Malachi 4, 4, all the way to 4, 6. Malachi 4, 4, all the way to 4, 6. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Now these are the last three verses in the Old Testament. And then there's a period of 400 years where there is no other writings. It's like God just closed his mouth. For his prophetic writings. Did you understand that? Now, if you were going to say something and then not say anything for 400 years, the things that you would say would be very important, correct? Listen to what God said. Now, this is in between the New Testament, excuse me, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Last words of the Old Testament. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. He brings up Moses. Remember. In this chapter, he's talking about the end times. You got it? Now listen to the first, excuse me, to the last three verses. I could have said four, but really the three. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Herob for all Israel. Israel means my people, for all my people. With the status and the judgments. Notice that it's the status and the what? Judgment. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming and of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That is talking about the end times. Before the coming of the what? Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's not talking about when Jesus came. Now, there are prophecies about Elijah uh, coming, and John the Baptist was Elijah, the, the one that presented Jesus, amen? But then there's also prophecies about the Elijah in Revelation chapter 11. Did you understand that? Do you know that the Jewish people are waiting for Elijah right now? Once a year? The hardcore Orthodox Jews, they even at a, at, at a table, they have an empty chair with all the plating settings waiting for him. Why? Because they're waiting for their Messiah, and Elijah must first what? Come. They are getting set up for the second coming. Because it's true, Elijah will come in Revelation chapter 11. And they will turn to God and accept Jesus. Hallelujah. And every year, they're waiting for him. Our manifestation of Elijah already came in John the Baptist. But they didn't receive him nor Jesus. But it's okay. Because now they're going to in the future. Amen? 
Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the, the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That is not when Jesus came. That was not the great and dreadful what? And great and dreadful day of the Lord. Why? Because the angels announced to the prophets, good tithing to all. Amen? The salvation? Anyway. Next verse. And he will turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children toward their fathers. Great restoration in families. Did you get that? Lest I come and smite the earth with a what? Curse. So this is one thing that we should focus on and one thing that we should claim and obey God on and please God on that he will restore what? The hearts of the fathers or their children, the children toward their what? Fathers. Notice I was reading today that 85% of men that are in prison are men that have had no father figures in their life. Did you get that? There's a great destruction. There's been such a war of eliminating the fathers out of the families. You got it? And the fathers have cooperated. Amen? By just abandoning children and, and, you know, I'm a stud. The more women I go to bed with, you know, the bigger the man I am. No, you're a harlot. And you need to repent for the damage that you have caused. If you could say, I've never committed any other sin, that one right there. If you had, you've had children, you've abandoned, you left a woman to, to, for her to get an abortion, or you've abandoned those children, you will go to hell if you don't repent and accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Is that clear enough? But God wants to lift that curse. I hope I'm being blunt enough. Maybe I should, you think I should clarify that? So the last two things he speaks is about Moses and Elijah. Then we go to the New Testament and we find out that Moses and Elijah appear in the New Testament physically. Go to Luke 9, verse 29. And as he appeared, the fashion of his, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment, raiment, raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there came with him two men, there came and talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah. I got news for everybody. Moses entered into the promised land. Where was the Mount of Transfiguration? In the promised land. When Jesus came, Moses was able to enter into the promised land because it says that Moses was there standing in the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples knew who he was. It's funny how, you know, your, your, your spiritual rank and your name People that are in the spirit automatically know who you are. You don't have to show them your driver's license. Who appeared in glory. There were Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. They had a meeting in the Mount of Transfiguration, a huddle before the next play, about Jesus dying. Did you get that? In Jerusalem. What he was going to do in Jerusalem. Now why would that happen? They were already in heaven. Surely they must have found out a few things. Why would they be translated back to earth? 
Hello? I want to read you another translation. Glory to God. I'm going to read it to you in the Living Bible. Luke 9, 31. They were splendid in appearance, glorious to see, and they were speaking of his death at Jerusalem to be carried out in accordance with God's plan. Now let me tell you why that meeting took place. The two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, did you get that? People have a problem with them coming, Moses and Elijah coming back in Revelation chapter 11. Well, you must surely have a problem then with them coming and appearing in the Mount of Transfiguration, correct? Especially when Moses came into the promised land. But you don't have a problem with that because you can't argue that. Let me tell you guys something. God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants it, except sin. He cannot sin. And it's time that the church quits telling God what he should do. Dun, 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 dun. Hallelujah. This plan that they talked about was simply this. Revelations chapter 11 could not come to pass unless Jesus had died and accomplished the work of the cross and been victorious over hell, death, and the grave. Haven't you noticed that before Revelations could be written, that the lamb had to come and what? And take the scroll from the father's hands and what? And open them? You know that in that chapter in Revelation, it says that no one was found worthy to what? To open the book of the future. And John wept. And one of the elders came, said, praise God for good elders. And ministered to him and said, Don't worry, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And you see Jesus. And he walks and he takes the book of Revelations. Can you agree that that's the book of Revelations? Amen? And then he opens it, and as we open it, we start finding out about the book of Revelations. Huh? Why? Because Jesus, Jesus, Open the book, Revelations, the seal. He had to have died and went over death, hell, and the grave. So the ministry of Moses and Elijah could be completed. Let me tell you something. Elijah was a great guy. But he did run. Didn't he? Moses was a great guy. But at that time, he was not allowed to enter into the promised land. Because he struck the rock and spoke harshly to it. But Jesus was perfect. And that's why they had to come to the perfect one. The perfect one had to accomplish his mission. For us to have our two heroes. That are going to lead in the end times. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now. Blessed be God. We're going into Revelations chapter 11. This was what the meeting was about. They were involved in the, in the end time play, the last play of the game. Revelations 11.1 1. Forget about the rapture at this moment. Don't, don't let that confuse. Concentrate on the two witnesses. Got it? That's what this is about. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. A measuring stick 
that look like a rod. You know, like a shepherd's rod. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood. Notice that the angel what? Stood. I want you to catch this. Saying, rise and measure the temple of God. Mimic me standing up. To deliver to you the word of the Lord. Because you're going to deliver it too. Amen? Glory to God. Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. This is happening, understand this, in the beginning, toward the beginning, the beginning of the seven years. The famous seven years that everybody fights about. Before, middle, or after. Remember, just get your minds up for the rapture and just read the word. Got it? Now, in the first, you, you have the seven years, but in the first three and a half years is when the ministry of the two witnesses is happening. Did you get that? How long did Jesus' ministry last? Somebody said three and a half years out here. Yep. Their ministry is going to last, the two witnesses, three and a half years. All of these are things pointing to Jesus, to the Jewish people. Listen to this. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Are you ready? But the court which is without the temple, leave out. So this is the city of Jerusalem. You know the wall that they pray at right now? Outside of the temple, I want you to get this. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot four and a half, four and two months. That's three and a half years. Now I know that there's been a lot of teaching, and I'm not messing with people, I'm just sharing with you, that Jerusalem is never going to be overtaken. God is going to what? Keep anybody from doing that. But I got news for everybody. God says that he's going to allow it. Jerusalem will be under the control of the Gentiles for three and a half years. That's controversial, what I just said, but I want to read it to you. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's three and a half years. Did you get that? So, church, get ready to see a treaty. That is going to hand over Jerusalem. And the Jews get to build their temple. Did you understand that? The great compromise. Is that clear enough? Let me read it one more time. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two what? Months. Three and a half years. Did you get that? Next verse. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Guess who, sho guess who shows up? In that first three and a half years, the two witnesses. Guess where? 
there in Israel. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. That's humility and, and, and humbleness before God. Guess for how long? Three and a half years. Did you get that? In that three and a half year period, the temple is going to be built. Did you get that? But the two witnesses will be here. Say hooray for our team. So we're focusing on the two and a half witness, not the Antichrist. And notice that this is focusing on who's going to be in control of the first three and a half years. Are you ready? The question, who is going to be in control of that first three and a half years? Are you ready? And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothes in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees. Can you remember when we read about this in the Old Testament? You need to go back and listen to the previous. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Now, a little refreshment course. We're going to see these two guys described again. Go to Zechariah. This was in the Old Testament, 4.11. Are you ready? Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlesticks and upon the left side thereof? Then he said, now this is verse 14, because we're not going to be able to go over all the verses. You need to go back to get that. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the, what? The Lord of the whole earth. Why? Because when this vision was given, Moses and Elijah were there in heaven before the throne of God. Now let's go back and reread Revelation 11.4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Gee, I wonder if it's talking about the same guys. Now we go back to Revelations. And if any man will hurt them, now remember, this is happening where? In Jerusalem, the holy city. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Yeah, um, what mantle produced that? Elijah and Elisha. Remember? If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Boom! Now I want you to imagine this in this first three and a half years. Two guys prophesying and doing the work of God, and if anybody tries to martyr them, they get consumed. Oh, we're not, the end time church is not going to be left out. Of leadership or of the great things that God has done. They will be done and magnified. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be what? Killed. 
oh, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like the God of the New Testament. Revelations is the New Testament. What do you think, that God just mellowed out as he got older? Well, he's mellow now, you know, he, he was young and reckless in the Old Testament. It's the same God. The only difference is this, is that the grace in the atonement blood of Jesus was shed so we could go to it. That we can be transformed and become a new creation. That's the difference. But if you don't go by that, guess what? God has not gotten mellower because he was reckless when he was younger. I'm sorry. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you know that people refuse to recognize the wrath of God in these days? If you mention something happens and God did it, oh, what a, what a fanatic, what a weirdo. And I'm talking about some Christian leaders. Our God wouldn't do that. Really? Really? Well, you better throw away the book of Revelations because God does a whole lot of things in the, Old Test I mean, in the New Testament. In Revelation. Revelation is the New Testament, amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Next, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. This is who was talked when it was talking about what? The Old Testament. God's been prophesying and showing us a glimpse of these guys. But we insist on studying the Antichrist and knowing what the order he's going to wear when he appears. Will he wear Nikes? Cheetahs? Pumas? Will he golf? We better start studying about what God's going to do. You know, the devil likes, likes to be, you know, he likes to be admired and talked about. Now, the next verse, which is Revelation uh, 6. These have power to shut heaven. Gee, let me see now. Fire consumes their enemies. That sure sounds like Elijah and Elisha. Amen. These have power to shut the heavens. What did Elijah do? Elisha, what did he do? He appeared to Ahab, and he said this, Mark my words, no rain shall fall upon the ground until I say so in the name of God. Three and a half what? Years, not a drop of rain hit the ground. Except this time, they're going to have the power to do this to the whole planet. Or wherever they want. That's how sound like the Antichrist is in control to you. Hallelujah. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. You know when the day means? The three and a half years. Completely. Let me tell you something. You're in control of water. You're in control of the whole planet. Hallelujah. And have power over waters. Now notice that it keeps on talking about power over what? Notice that the reason why the prophet Elijah, why he had control through the prophetic word of God, really God had control, was because he had control over what? The waters, the rain. Notice that Moses took complete control over Egypt when the water turned into blood. What are you going to do when you have no water? Huh? Notice that he also had control over what? The waters have power over waters to turn them 
to blood. Gee, that, I wonder if that's talking about Moses. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they would. Will. Some translations said as often as they want. That's how sound like Moses and Elijah to you. Who's in control? Why don't we preach about this? If you're hearing this message, I want to encourage you to spread this word out like wildfire. The devil is going to have to pout. Because you're taking his lying glory away. I got news for the church and everybody. God is in control. And not from heaven alone, but here on earth. He'll have two prophets. Let me tell you what the prophetic has power over. You know what, how God described the prophetic to one prophet that was about to be anointed? You're going to root up what? Kingdoms, nations. And you're going to plant nations. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. That's three and a half years. Isn't that what the Word of God said? And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Let me tell you guys something, okay? Let me tell, let me tell you something about the world order. Let me tell you something about the UN. I'm going to tell you something. God is God, and He doesn't need anybody's opinion or vote on what to do on the planet. Let me tell you what God is going to do. Are you ready? These two prophets will be on earth, and when a country does something that displeases God, they're going to prophesy over that country, and that country's going to be hit with plagues. Oh! With plagues. Waters will be turned to blood. And it won't matter who doesn't like it. And he's going to get a lot of countries' attentions. Because the new world order is going to sit there and twiddle their thumbs because they're not going to be able to do anything about it. If I may add, they're going to begin to whoop on themselves. For three and a half years, these two prophets, and get ready because I'm going to give you evidence for this too, and the church is going to have such a prophetic mantle over it That there's going to be a domination for three and a half years of the planet. I've said it. Well, that takes the glory of Satan away for three and a half years. And that is our last verse for tonight. And we continue next week. Every single one of you that are here, every single one of you that are watching, spread this word. Show them the verses. Go back and study this. We need to, and God likes it. We need to tell everybody that God, and wait till we get into the other three and a half years. I just, I just thought I cut it to the middle just to give everybody a break, because I needed a break when God first gave me this. And by the way, I didn't get this. By any natural way, at the end of the message, I'm going to tell you how I got all of this. 
And by the way, when the Lord first gave it to me, I said, oh, please. This is contrary to everything that I've been taught. People might hurt my feelings. Some might not like this messed with. Just like I didn't like you messing with it, God. You know, God can just come in and, and take your little doctrinal world and he can just hop in and go, hello. First one right here. I've heard others with this same message. One of the greatest confirmation that I got was from this one great man of God. I almost fell to the ground because God has given me this. And, um, and when it came out of his mouth, I didn't know what to do with myself. He's passed away now. But he preached this message. I had already gotten it. Then I hear him preach it. And then he passed away. God is in control, church. Have we established the first three and a half years of God's total domination over the planet? Now next week we're going to talk about and going to show you evidence of the church praying this stuff with the two. Church, I want you to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm dangerous to the Antichrist and darkness. I'm dangerous. How have we bought this other baloney? I don't mean to insult teachers. Maybe I shouldn't have said it like that because I... <laughs> Because I used to believe different, and you know, and I repent for saying what I just did. Some of you have probably won more souls than me to Jesus and done greater things than me. But please, God gets stirred up when we preach and teach and believe how great He is under the worst circumstances. That's when he raises up and he says, well, if they believe I'm like that, they must have the right guy. They're talking about me before they were talking about somebody else, I think. Let's throw our kiss up to Jesus and we'll see you next week. Hallelujah.